This lecture will deal with first the expansion of the United States within its continental boundaries and secondly the growth of an American empire. Today the US and China are saber-rattling in the South China Sea as the US attempts to curtail Chinese expansion and China seeks to protect its main trade artery. The origins of this conflict can be traced to what will be discussed in this lecture. The expansion of the United States within its continental boundaries is called continentalism. It is important to have an idea, an image of the leaps westward taken by the United States. Looking at this image in slide two, moving right to left is the initial line of westward expansion. The first the line between settled and unsettled America is called the frontier. And the first stop of the frontier was the apex of the Appalachians. As we recall, the crest of the Appalachians was the limit of westward expansion imposed by the British after the French and Indian War with the proclamation of 1763. The Treaty of Paris 1783 ended the Revolutionary War and British land to the Mississippi became American land. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson used implied power to make the Louisiana Purchase, a territory explored by Lewis and Clark. Smaller swaths of territory controlled by European nations along the Gulf of Mexico and at the mouth of the Mississippi were annexed or ceded to the United States. In 1818, riding a wave of American nationalism, Andrew Jackson went into Spain, into Spanish Florida, chasing Indians. He came into conflict with Spanish, with the Spanish who recognized that despite their loss to the British in the War of 1812, Andrew Jackson was a formidable foe and that American might would defeat them. They signed over Florida to the United States in the adams onis Treaty in 1819. The conflict in Texas following the Alamo saw a Texan Republic established in 1845 and the vast Mexican cession was acquired with the end of the Mexican War and the signing of the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty in 1848. Northern expansion and conflict with Britain saw the extension of the 49 degree latitude established under the Webster-Ashburton Treaty to the West Coast. The other bits and pieces you can see for yourself on the slide. The line between settled and unsettled America is called the frontier and it was finally closed by the 1890s. The growth of railroads helped the movement of people west and the influx of 13 mil million immigrants pushed the government to introduce incentives for trans-Mississippi settlement. For example, the Homestead Act of 1862 for a small application fee gave immigrants or settlers 160 acres and in return they had to cultivate the land for five years. The Timber Culture Act expanded on this and settlers got an extra 60, 60 acres if they planted trees on at least 45 acres of land. As settlement hit the drier southwestern parts of the United States the Desert Land Act of 1877 offered 640 acres if the land was irrigated. Between 1860 and 1912, Kansas, Nevada, Nebraska, Colorado, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Washington, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, New Mexico and Arizona were formed and added to the Union. As the settlers moved west, they came into conflict with Native American Indians, of whom there were 240,000 living west of the Mississippi. Because they did not farm, the settlers felt they should be moved off the land. With western migration of settlers and the slaughter of thousands of buffalo, the Indian way of life was threatened and they resisted. The federal government, to deal with the Indians, had created the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1849 to make deals and treaties with them. But treaties signed were invariably broken and massacres on both sides occurred. These were the Indian Wars of the late 1860s. 
The federal government followed this outbreak of violence, following this outbreak of violence, pursued a policy of Americanization, where Indians were now treated as wards or under the protection of the United States. They were no longer seen as sovereign entities, which meant the land could be taken for the settlers. Clashes with the Indians continued up to the 1880s until Geronimo surrendered in 1886 and the final massacre and defeat of Indian nation occurred in 1890 at the Battle of Wounded Knee. By 1887, government policy towards the Indians changed again and the tribal system was ended as, the federal, as federal policy under the Dawes Act was to break up tribal lands into separate farms. This process of assimilation they hoped would speed up Americanization of Indians. In 1934, the government repealed the Dawes Act and restored tribal lands with the Indian Reorganization Act. By the 1950s, the federal government started putting Indian responsibility on the states with a policy called termination. Federal responsibility for the Indians returned again in the 1960s with tribal ways pushed, but by then many Indians had migrated to the cities. Their sense of balance and head for heights gave them much employment in the construction business. Here we see Indian workers on skyscrapers being built in New York City. Their tremendous balance and absolute no fear of heights made them well suited to the task. Industrialization and the closing of the frontier led to American expansion beyond its borders. This was called the New Manifest Destiny. An important factor in this overseas expansion was the publication of Alfred T. Mann's The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. This stressed the importance of overseas expansion and the need for an empire to protect the needs of the mother country. From previous studies, we know the driving forces behind imperialism. Economically, the need for raw materials to feed the industrialists and the need for, raw uh, need for markets drove the forces of imperialism. Hawaii and the Philippines provided coaling stations for steamships and seaports for American ships engaged in the massive trade across the Pacific. Politically, military bases defended American interests and warned off other great powers. Today, the United States has about 700 military bases worldwide. Socially, Christian missionaries spread the word of God among poorer nations. Today, Habitat for Humanity and the Peace Corps carry on this legacy of early missionaries. This slide gives us an overview of American expansionism in the Pacific and the island empire that was created. Venezuela today is much in the news. Back in the 19th century, it came into conflict with Great Britain over a border dispute with British Guyana that escalated when gold was discovered. Britain resolved to settle the dispute by military means but was discouraged from doing so by the issuance of the Olney Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. That is, foreign nations would not be allowed to impose their will on Western Hemisphere nations. The British agreed to arbitration and the Monroe Doctrine was upheld. In 1898, the US went to war with Spain over Cuba. Spain controlled Cuba and when a violent revolt broke out, the Spanish cracked down ruthlessly. Concentration camps were established and over 200,000 Cubans died in the horrendous conditions that existed in them. It wasn't America's fight, so how did the United States become involved? The first was by yellow journalism, which is the media sensationalizing events to influence public opinion. In the newspapers, the Spanish became the bogeyman and people clamoured for the United States to help the Cubans and become involved. The Delome letter was a letter written by a Spanish minister to the United States that was leaked to the press. It described President McKinley as weak and a bidder for the admiration of the crowd. The minister resigned 
but the letter further inflamed anti-Spanish sentiment. Finally, an American warship in Havana Harbor, the Maine, was blown up, probably by the Cubans who wanted the Spanish blamed. This is called a false flag operation, and it worked. The Spanish were blamed, and the United States demanded Spain leave the island. When the Spanish refused, war was declared. It was a short war, but brought important territorial gains for the Americans. Most of the 5,000 US casualties came from disease and from eating bad packaged meat. Only 450 deaths came from combat. It brought Teddy Roosevelt to national fame, leading his victorious Rough Riders who played an important part in the capture of Santiago. The war ended with the signing of the Treaty of Paris in October 1898. In it, the United States got Puerto Rico and Guam from Spain and agreed to buy the Philippines from them for 20 million. In Cuba, the Cubans agreed to the Platt Amendment to their constitution, which gave the United States the right to interfere in Cuban affairs and also the use of a naval base. Today, it's Guantanamo. The Philippines, mean, Filipinos, meanwhile, revolted against their new leaders and it took 60,000 American troops to crush the revolt. With peace restored, the United States passed the Philippine Government Act, which gave the Filipinos partial self-government. And in 1946, the Tidings McDuffie Act gave them full independence. The United States did maintain an important military base in Manila, Subic Bay, until 1991, when it was closed. Following the United States, following the Spanish-American War, the United States took the stage as a world power. The first area it exercised its influence in was China. Western powers and Japan had all colonized parts of China and to prevent competing against each other, each other's interests, they divided China into spheres of influence or areas that were under indirect control of an outside power. Left out of this were the Americans who saw their economic interests threatened. So the Secretary of State, John Hay, put forward an open door policy, one that would create an atmosphere of equal opportunity for all in trade, investment and profit. A second push on the open door policy happened after the Boxer Rebellion. With their position now of a world power, the United States got the other powers to agree and the policy formally began in March 1900. The password today is Big Stick. I repeat, the password today is Big Stick. Japan was the next area of foreign policy that the United States dealt with. The Taft-Katsura Agreement in 1905 saw both countries recognizing their spheres of influence, Japan's over Korea and the United States over the Philippines. On the west coast of America in the late 1800s, large-scale immigration from Japan led to friction with Western Americans. They viewed Asians as a yellow peril and in San Francisco, a school district segregated Japanese students from other students. Japan immediately wrote a letter of complaint to the United States. And in 1907, a gentleman's agreement was reached, whereupon Japan agreed to deny passports to laborers intending to enter the United States and recognizing the right of the United States to deny Japanese immigrants holding passports originally issued for other countries the right of entry. Finally, in 1908, the Root Takihara Agreement saw both countries agree to respect each other's rights in the Asian arena. The Spanish-American War also brought to the forefront the need for a shorter route from the East Coast to the West Coast. When hostilities broke out in Cuba, an American battleship stationed in California almost missed the war because of the distance down and around South of America it took to get to the Caribbean. The idea of a canal had always been in the minds of the great powers. In 1850, the British and Americans had signed the clayton bulmer Treaty, saying neither of them would try to get exclusive rights to build a canal either through Panama or Nicaragua. After the Spanish-American War, in the Hay-Ponce Treaty, 
The British gave up these rights as America looked in greater detail into building a canal. The French had already attempted to build a canal, but the cost in both physical and financial terms was too much. In 1902, the Americans bought the rights from the French and proceeded to hammer out a deal with the Colombians who controlled Panama. The hay Haran Treaty was signed. In it, the United States would get a 99-year lease, a canal zone six miles wide that they would control, pay 10 million to the Colombians and 250,000 per annum, but the 40 million the United States was paying to the French would all go to the French. When Ponce Forte brought the treaty back to Colombia, the government refused to ratify it. 10 million was not enough, they claimed, plus the French rights to build a canal were about to expire. So if they delayed, they could get 40 million for themselves. Finally, a canal zone might encourage Panamanians to seek independence. Roosevelt was impatient and knew if things were delayed, the Colombian price would go much higher. As luck would have it, Panama rebelled against Colombia. A cynical eye would see an American hand behind this action. And of course, the United States backed the Panamanians. In November 1903, a republic was declared and the hay bruno Varilla Treaty was signed, with mostly the same conditions as the hay Ponsefort Treaty. Roosevelt would later claim, I took the canal. Construction finally began. It was a difficult engineering feat with locks to raise up ships to higher levels. Malaria killed and sickened many of the 40,000 workers and the cost at the time was 347 million. The first trip took place in 1914. Today, about 14,000 ships a year use the Panama Canal. The canal zone under American control became prosperous and well-to-do. The 2008 presidential candidate John McCain was born here, but the poverty surrounding the zone led to increasing resentment among Panamanians. In 1964, riots broke out and resentment lingered. Finally, in 1978, with a view to gaining more trust and respect among Latin American nations, President Jimmy Carter signed a treaty that would hand over American control of the canal zone to Panama in 1999. The US could use the canal forever and the US could defend the canal militarily if needs be. The third condition of the treaty was put into effect in 1989 when Manuel Norega was captured in an invasion of Panama. The canal zone was secured and Noriega taken back to the United States to serve time on drug charges. The three progressive presidents each had their own style of foreign policy. Roosevelt's big stick policy, where the African adage of speak softly and carry a big stick was used, and America exercised its right as an international policeman. Diplomacy, yes, but with the threat of military action. The big stick diplomacy was used in Venezuela, Dominican Republic, Cuba, and even at the Algeciras conference regarding Morocco. His Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine involved actively intervening in countries' affairs in Latin America if they had to. Taft's policy was dollar diplomacy, where he substituted dollars for bullets. He also expanded America's international police power, introducing the Lodge Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, where any attempt to sell strategic land in the Western Hemisphere would be opposed by the United States. Woodrow Wilson's missionary diplomacy was to help promote democracy and further the cause of world peace. He introduced cooling off treaties where commissions would make decisions on international disputes but would do it slowly so things would cool down. He used dollar diplomacy in Nicaragua and used watchful waiting in regard to instability in Mexico. Please do the following questions in the corresponding spot in your Google quiz. I should give you X amount of seconds per question. If you need more, please pause the video. Thank you.
This concludes our lecture for today. Thank you for your time and attention.